Hi, and welcome to Ann Bradley's classroom on the Praxis Circle campus. I'm Doug Monroe, the Executive Director of Praxis Circle. Praxis Circle is an educational nonprofit headquartered in Richmond, Virginia, near Washington, D.C., whose mission is to renew free and good societies by building worldviews. We do this in small groups by creating all kinds of video and digital content, but particularly by, interest, by interviewing national and international thought leaders representing most worldview topics from our own Christian perspective. perspective. Over the last five years, we've developed an extensive video and content library. We really appreciate your time today. For some of you on Eastern US time over today's lunch break, and we hope over the next two sessions to make it worth your attention. Personal relationships with our members are everything to us. That's really what we're all about. Just two more points before moving on. First, an orthodox, an orthodox Christian economic model is not about the dreaded prosperity gospel. We all know our meaningful guarantees are few in this life, but matching one's behavior to the way we understand a good world is designed and how we experience it ought to have spiritual and even material benefits. Second, this is our first time through this. We hope to repeat it and then use our extensive video library to design other worldview courses, addressing other key topics like worldview itself, politics, social structure, including family, church, etc. Our library can already handle this, and we're building it with a run rate of about seven contributor interviews per year, which are extensive interviews with a lot of preparation. More exciting interviews are already scheduled and planned, and we are building toward these courses and doing so. With the future in mind, we look forward to getting your key thoughts very soon after the course is over. Mason New, on to you. Thank you, Doug. Uh, on behalf of the entire Praxis Circle community, I welcome you to the first of a two-part webinar series entitled The Christian Economic Model with Dr. Ann R. Bradley. My name is Mason New, and I serve as the Praxis Circle's Education Director in order to bring you the best learning programs designed to help you build your worldview. Today, our speaker is Dr. Ann Bradley. She is the George and Sally Mayer Fellow for Economic Education and Academic Director at the Fund for American Studies in Washington, D.C. She is a professor of economics at the Institute for World Politics and a senior affiliate at the Acton Institute. She's a former vice president at the Institute of Faith, Works, and Economics, and she is the co-editor and author of Counting the Cost, Christian Perspectives on Capitalism, for the least of these, a biblical answer to poverty, and be fruitful and multiply why economics is necessary for making God-pleasing decisions. And all of you by attending today will receive a digital copy of this book. Finally, Dr. Bradley is one of our Praxis Circle contributors. She earned a PhD and a master's degree in economics from George Mason University and a bachelor's degree in economics from James Madison University. She is married and is a mother of two children. Today's webinar will cover economics from a Christian point of view in order to explore how biblical thinking and economic flourishing are connected and essential for healthy, free, and vibrant economies. Dr. Bradley will speak for approximately 40 to 45 minutes, and then there will be time to ask questions. We have a large group of participants today from all over the United States, so please write your questions using the Q&A button on your Zoom interface. I'll try to ask as many of these questions to Dr. Bradley as I can, and then we will end a little bit before 1.15. Again, thank you all for being here, and with that, I will turn over the virtual floor to Dr. Ann Bradley. Thank you, Mason, and thank you, Doug. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, and although I can't see everyone, I guess this is the benefit of a digital classroom. We can be together um, 
And so in, in kind of a short time frame today, I want to try to build the biblical case for human flourishing. And then the next time we meet, we're going to layer in some more of the economic implications. I will go over um, kind of what I call the economic way of thinking today, because I think that comes right out of who we are in scripture. So I'm going to try to do that in our time together today. And, and um, as I said, next time we meet, we're going to kind of build this more into specific policy questions and um, questions of what types of political systems or economic systems are most appropriate. Um, so let's get my screen to cooperate. Uh, here we go. Okay, so I want to try to kind of answer three questions or or ask three things. Um, and I think it's really important to start in Genesis because um, that's after all where it all begins. And I think in Genesis we get a lot of information about who we are, but more importantly, who God is and how we fit into um, His universe and His purposes. And uh, I think really from the start we start to get questions about okay, well you know, how do we live today? So I think the first, you know, thing we should do when we ask questions about economic systems, political systems, legal systems is, you know, kind of get to the beginning and say, okay, what are God's designs and desires for his creation? And that allows us a way to kind of think through how we fit into his, you know, kind of um, ultimately designed and beautiful world. So he's the ultimate artist and the ultimate creator. And so we need to ask those questions. What does he want? Why are we here? What do we do? And I actually think Genesis gives us a lot of information about that. I think sometimes we read Genesis, especially my kids read Genesis in Sunday school. And the implications are, you know, you get the order of creation and you certainly do get that. But I also think a deep study of Genesis informs how we live in the 21st century. Uh, and so that's really a powerful thing. Number two, what principles are revealed to us in creation that can inform, like I said, how we live today? So I think that this is, um, Genesis gives us a lot of um, modern implications for what to do and how to live. And then really quickly, as you'll see, when we start talking about this, political economy questions come up. Well, what kind of, you know, if there's truths of human nature, if there are truths of the universe that we can identify, then that means um, that there's going to have to be societal requirements that respect those truths. And kind of economic systems and legal systems that don't respect those realities are probably not gonna get us the outcomes that we say that we want. So starting from the beginning, um, I think I like to pay some attention here to Genesis 1 verses 27 and 28. You can of course read the whole chapter, I encourage that. Uh, but I, these two verses are really important because look what you see here, you see this phrase that we are created in God's image repeated three times just in the first verse. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So we are made in the image and likeness of God. And that is true for men and women. Okay, so there's also kind of an egalitarian um, element here to human nature that both men and women are image bearers. And this is an active thing. You are actively walking around bearing the image and likeness of God. And so this means something about who we are, and it means something about what we're supposed to do. Uh, the first verse leads to the second verse. So the second verse here in this passage says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So it is because we are, and, and the phrase that's used to describe this is imago dei, because we are imago dei, then we get dominion. We can only have dominion and the mandate to be fruitful and multiply because we are made in the image and likeness of God. So there's something unique about human beings that allows us to do what tw verse 28 asks us to do. So often this is called the creation mandate. It's called the cultural mandate. And the idea is that in Genesis, at the very beginning, God gives us our marching orders. We're told who we are, and there are implications about what we're responsible for doing. And I just want to kind of say here for a moment I think it's really hard to do this, but really important to try to do it well. And that is to not read into scripture what we want it to say 
and we're human beings. And so that's a very easy thing to do. And so what I'm trying to do here is, and I'm just spending a little bit of time on scripture, uh, but I think it's important for us to look at the meta narrative of scripture. So I'm kind of pulling out some threads here that are woven through scripture, but I think it's really important for us to look at what is the big picture of scripture. So I'm kind of going to make the case today that biblical, or excuse me, that human flourishing is part of the meta narrative of scripture. It's what we're supposed to do. It's who we are. And it's actually how God designed the universe to function. It's, it's function is to create greater levels of human flourishing. So if human flourishing is also not a static concept. It's a moving, um, changing concept. So I think that's, I just want to say that. So kind of we're going to the second chapter of Genesis here. And this is, you get more information about who we are. Um, we're created to work, right? So this idea here is um, in Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it and to take care of it. And those are separate phrases in the original Hebrew and they're important and complementary. So let's take the second phrase to take care of it. Um, I think it's really important here. You can go back to Genesis 1 and look at God's reflection on his creation after each day. After each day, he says, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. On the last day, he says, it's very good. And it's very good because it's created, it's finished, but it's not done, right? So God's part is he's created um, beautifully us and the created order, but then we're given our marching orders about we're supposed to do things with it, okay? And so to take care of it is important because it means don't destroy it. Um, don't use up all of our resources. So when you think about environmental concerns, those become really important here. I think it's more than just environmental concerns, right? We're not supposed to plunder our natural resources, but we're also not supposed to plunder our talents, right? We're supposed to think about how to be good stewards. So we're supposed to take care of it. But note that here in this verse, God doesn't say, I did all this, th these seven days of creation, very good. Now, my commandment to you is to stand and watch over every blade of grass and make sure nothing ever gets touched. He doesn't say that. So it's not just that we take care of it. It's that we take care of it. And what do we do? This is the first phrase, work it. So we're to work it, which is an active verb. And we do this, and, and that's kind of one of the big questions, right? How do we work? And we work it by using our human creativity. So, and that's, where does a human creativity come from? It comes from being made in the image and likeness of God. God is the ultimate creator, right? We can't create in the way that God creates, but we can and are asked, mandated at, rather, to create. So we're to work it. And the word here is abad. Abad has several different translations. One, it means to till, right? So you're supposed to cultivate the earth. Um, so we've been given these raw materials and we are asked to change them, right? Till the ground. Um, and why would someone till the ground? Because they're they're changing it in some way to grow something, right? Or to um, do something with the soil that's going to make it productive for human beings. Um, another interpretation or translation of a bot is to serve. And I think that's really important because it comes out. What is our work for? Our work is to serve God and his creation. And of course, each other, because we are part of that creation. So these phrases go together which is hard because it means we're supposed to think about preserving God's creation into the future, right? We're supposed to take care of it, but we're also, also supposed to change it, right? Um, at, by tilling a garden, by working it, by unleashing our human creativity, by discovering um, and learning, okay? So now again, um, third, third chapter of, tennis, of Genesis, this becomes difficult, right? Because of the fall. And so I just highlight this um, kind of a little excerpt here. Cursed is the ground because of you through painful toil. You will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. The fall is the point at which sin enters the world. And Oz Guinness, I think, is really good about articulating the implications or the consequences of sin. He says it breaks our four primary relationships. So it breaks our relationship with God. It breaks our relationship with others. It breaks our relationship with ourselves and it breaks our relationship with the earth. So these four kind of primary relationships that we live in because we're social, right? We don't live kind of like on an island 
alone. We don't live in a lab. We live amongst each other. And so sin just is devastating for what God has asked us to do, right? So there's brokenness, there's incapacity, there's lack of fulfillment, there's frustration. But what does God say? He doesn't say, well, you know, all that stuff I told you in Genesis 1 and 2, never mind. Disregard that because you you chose sin and therefore kind of now we can't do what I asked you to do. He actually says, do it anyway. It's just going to be frustrating. It's going to be fulfilling. It's not always going to work out how you want what does he say here? Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It's really important for us to keep in mind, this is not what God designed. When he designed the created order, it was not, sin wasn't part of that. So painful toil is the curse of sin. Toil isn't the curse of sin. We were always asked to work, right? But sin means our work is painful toil rather than fulfilling work fulfilling discovery, right? Fulfilling learning. So he doesn't, he doesn't retract his commandment. In fact, he says, you got to keep doing it because that's, that, that's your telos. Your, your telos is to kind of bring about greater levels of human flourishing, but it's going to be harder now. This gets reiterated. So in Genesis 9, after the flood, right? After kind of God unleashes his anger on the world and kind of, you know, resets it, Noah and his family get off the ark. What does he say to them? Genesis 9-1, be fruitful and multiply. So he actually, after punishment, right? After unleashing wrath, what does he do? He reiterates what he always has asked us to do. Now go forth, be fruitful and multiply. So that is reiterated through scripture. That is what we're supposed to do. And I think we understand kind of the multiply part, right? I think we truncate that to growing families, having families, living in communities. That's what it means to multiply, right? We have a responsibility to our families, to our parents, to our children, et cetera. Um, what does be fruitful mean, right? So I think that kind of thinking about how we are fruitful and thinking about the role of work is really an important part of what Christians are supposed to think about in terms of their role in the world today, right? So we're not promised it's always going to be successful. In fact, we're promised struggle. Right, struggle is actually a really important component of, of the biblical understanding of flourishing because the struggle is where we lean on and rely on God. So it's not promised to be problem free, but it's it's promised to have meaning, and it's what we're supposed to do. So the goal of all of this, as you know, kind of from the title of this kind of discussion, is human flourishing. That's what we want. That's what we need. That's what God designed us for. He designed us to both participate and consume human flourishing. And I think that's a really important thing. Participate, so bring about greater levels of human flourishing, but also benefit from it, right? So think about the garden. The garden is a place of almost unlimited abundance, not unlimited, right? There's a finite number of trees on the earth after God is finished. But Adam and Eve are able to kind of go in many directions with those raw materials. But the most important thing they have is their brain, right? That's their human creativity. And they're asked to use that human creativity to advance what God gave them, right? And so this idea of human flourishing is an active participation with each other. And Jonathan Pennington, I think, is one of the best theologians out there who kind of thinks about and writes about human flourishing. This is just a very small excerpt um, from one of his papers on human flourishing. And this is what he says. So when we talk about human flourishing and we read scripture, we tend to kind of um, see the word shalom. And when we see the word shalom, we tend to, in our heads, translate that as peace. And so Pennington and others, he's not the only one, but um, I think what they call us to is to say that's a narrow and insufficient understanding of what it means to flourish. So shalom is not just peace. It's not just the absence of conflict. That's what peace is, right? The absence of violence, the absence of conflict, but rather Pennington here is trying to articulate for us a bigger conception of flourishing. And so he says, shalom is human health and wholeness resulting in strength, fertility, and longevity. The vision of shalom is at the core of God's redeeming work. And I think this is really powerful. It means that 
God's redemptive work in the world is about restoring shalom amongst sinners so they can participate and benefit from, right? They can both produce and consume shalom, uh, flourishing. Look at the words he's using, Pennington is using here to describe a state of shalom, a state of human flourishing. It includes health, which what does that mean? Not dying early from diseases, living long, healthy lives, right? Being able to fully participate in life, um, not being debilitated by disease and sickness. Wholeness, right? The whole human being is attended to. Um, and this results in strength, right? We're strong, we're fertile, we have longevity. This is really remarkable because it's a theological explanation for how material well being fits into biblical human flourishing. So, as Doug mentioned at the beginning, what we are not extolling here is kind of some version of the prosperity gospel, which you know, might say something like, if you do what you're supposed to do, then you'll be rich, right? You'll like have a mansion and a bunch of Mercedes in your driveway or all the things that you want, whatever those things are, right? But that's not what Pennington is saying. And more, more importantly, that's not what scripture is saying. I think Pennington is trying to articulate what scripture, how it characterizes this ongoing state of human flourishing, right? But think about the first three kind of phrases there. You can't have human health if you don't have material advancement. That's a remarkable kind of insight, I think, from him. So, and if you think about the long scope of human history, it has not been one of longevity or health or wholeness or living to old age, right? Or living in a prosperous society. It's been about exploitation, marginalization, early death, you know, scavenging for food, subsistence, this type of thing. So that is not how it was designed to be by God. But that's been a, a long part of the story of the human condition. So I kind of want to spend a moment on Jeremiah here, too, because I think it helps us understand the biblical, a biblical description of prosperity. This is also a dangerous word, right? I think a lot of times we use words that kind of can be dangerous um, because a, a lot of different people attach different meanings to them. And so we're sometimes talking past each other. So Jeremiah 29, 7, this is a letter written to people who have been carried into exile. So they don't know what to do and they're afraid and they've been removed from their comfort and their surroundings. And it says, seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. For if it prospers, you prosper. This is a really important idea here, right? Which is that biblical prosperity is mutual. Biblical prosperity is not exclusive or exploitative, meaning if I get more stuff because you have less stuff, right? It's not, that's kind of an economics, we call that a zero sum game. I win by taking some of your stuff. And so I'm better off and you're worse off in society on net. We've just moved wealth around. We haven't made anybody really better. And in the long run, that type of a society makes everybody worse, right? Because people have incentives to steal. And so the Jeremiah here is saying, you know, even though you're captives, even though you're in exile, I'm going to go back and do everything I told you to do from the beginning, right? Have children, encourage them to get married, encourage them to have families. So build the city, even though you're exiled, build the city. But the peace and the prosperity of the city depend on, right, both you prospering and the city prospering. And so I think that those are, again, really important conceptions of human flourishing and very kind of contrary to some of what you hear out there um, in terms of cultural narratives about what it means to flourish and what it means to kind of thrive and all these types of things. So really quickly, just so I'm not telling an Old Testament story here, again, the meta narrative of scripture is inerrant and we need to understand it. It's important for us to understand that. But in the New Testament, you kind of get some of these ideas reiterated, right? Which is you know, we're to told to go and make disciples of all nations. This is the Great Commission, right? And so our job as believers, as Christians, is to reach out into the world and um, extend the love and um, the mercy and the grace, all of that of Christ, and make disciples out of people. So that's part of our purpose, right? And we don't tend to think of that or correlate that with material, you know, the work that we do. Um, you know, your nine to five job um, 
may not explicitly look like making disciples, but there's all those arenas that Osgin has talked about, all the different relationships, and we're going to work in all of those different arenas. And so we're always supposed to be working towards that. And then the great commandment, right? Jesus, so kind of, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind. It's the first and greatest commandment, but what's the second? To love our neighbor as ourselves. So how are we going to go out into the world, make disciples, and making disciples mean does not mean using force, right? It doesn't mean kind of forcing people to believe in Jesus. It means wooing them, right? It means inviting them in. And it also means that we have to live in a way that we're allowed to love our, love our neighbor as ourselves. So you might be wondering right now, like, what does any of this have to do with economics? Um, and I'm going to try to build that case that kind of some of the principles and the principal assumptions of economics fall right out of the truths of scripture. And so in that, we get this, what, this framework to think about well, what are we supposed to do and what kind of societies are we supposed to be agitating for? You know, like what policies are good ones and what policies are bad ones? And of the isms, capitalism, socialism, what are, what's good and what's bad? And we'll talk more about that the next time. So I want to spend a little bit of time on these kind of anthropological truths that we know, right? These are true for all times, for all people. And I'm just not convinced that you can get to these truths objectively without scripture. I mean, you can claim them, but I'm not sure, you know, kind of the how behind it without scripture. So what's true of human beings? We have dignity. Why do we have dignity? Because we're Imago Dei. That's where our dignity comes from, right? And that has to be preserved in economic systems, legal systems, political systems, even culture. If we're not respecting human dignity, we're not on, gonna be able to kind of um, chart that path to greater levels of human flourishing. Of course, the world we live in today, we can look around us and say, we know this is really hard. And um, even in the best societies, right? The richest societies, there's lots of problems. Um, people have agency, right? So they have free will. And they can choose. And how do they choose? By using their reason, right? So kind of human beings are the crowning jewel of God's creation because we have reason. We're be able to be thoughtful. We can, as Father Sirico says, the Act Institute, we can reflect on our reflections. I think that's a great way to think about reason. And we're unique. There has never been another you. You are, um, you, you are not a duplicate, okay? You're um, irreplicable. And so that is really an important concept if you think about the core of economics, right? So the core of economic thinking needs to stem from these anthropological truths. If we weren't different, we could have no reason, we would have no reason to trade with people. Trade is based on people being different, having different skills, having different talents, that diversity that God gifted us with actually is what propels us into these kind of social relationships, commercial and non-commercial, right? Because we need each other. The other kind of idea that comes, this is an economic phrase, but I really think it stems from these anthropological objective truths, which is that people have this, what we call an economic subjective value. And what that means is that people assign values to things um, based on their needs, based on their wants, based on their desires, right? And so like but the example that I always use in my classroom is, if I said to my students, okay, hey, we're going to go out after, you know, we're going to go for lunch after class. And, uh, you know, there's 20 people in this class and we're going to get to choose three pizzas. The deliberation process in choosing the three pizzas would take up most of our lunch hour, right? Because everybody likes their pizza different. Some like thin crust, some like cheesy crust, some don't, you know, some people are gluten-free, some people are vegan, some people like Hawaiian pizza. I don't understand that preference. Some people don't want pineapples on their pizza at all, right? So we have these different tastes and preferences. And why? It's because we're unique, right? And so that drives us into society wanting different things. And so again, this already starts to beg questions about how are we going to satisfy people's needs and wants when, when they're all different and we really don't know what people want and need. The other idea that's important in the kind of thinking about the economic model um, is people engage in purposive action. So Ludwig von Mises writes an enormously important book in the, the early part of the 20th century. It's called Human Action. He spends the first third of that book. Um, you know, it's a 900 page book. So he spends the first third of that book talking about what he calls praxeology or kind of the calculus of choice. Why do people decide to make choices? And so what he comes up with, not 
a Christian, as far as I understand. I don't believe he was Christian, although I think he was influenced by some of them. But the reason he was a good economist is because he, he tied into these objective truths and he made them the foundation of his economic thinking and his economic models. Uh, so this is what it looks like kind of for a human being to decide to engage in a choice. First, we experience a state of uneasiness. So we kind of feel uneasy about our situation and we want to do something about it. So that's part two or step two, right? We have a vision for a better outcome. And what that means is that I'm uneasy about something, but in my mind's eye, I can imagine that by doing something, I can change how I feel about the situation, right? And number three, we take conscious and purposeful steps to get there. Really, really important assumption that economists make or should make. And if we don't make that, I think we're led astray in terms of, again, thinking about policy and economic systems and things like this. So this is a really important point. What we're assuming is that people have free will and people have agency. And so what everybody is doing every time they're engaging in a choice is they are trying to alleviate their current state of affairs, right? Improve their state of affairs. And they do that by imagining outcomes. And then they do what? Of all the things I could do to make myself better off in this scenario, I'm going to be very purposeful in picking the ones that what have the highest benefit and the lowest cost. So in economics, we talk about people kind of being profit maximizers. And what we really mean by that is people want to maximize their benefit. They want to minimize their costs. So the most kind of fundamental example of this that I can think of is, you know, when you wake up at some point in the morning, your body needs fuel. Your body sends you signals to tell you that, right? Like you're hungry and you need to do something about it. And so think about going through this process, right? I'm hungry. I have a vision of I can do something, which is to eat breakfast, right? And I'm going to alleviate only temporarily because I'm going to get hungry again, but I'm going to alleviate temporarily my uneasiness. Now, there's a variety of things you can do for breakfast, right? You can eat a really healthy breakfast, avocado toast and eggs and a piece of turkey bacon or something, or you can eat 10 donuts, right? So um, you are always actively trying to say, what is, what am I trying to maximize here? Do I just want it to taste good? Or, you know, and maybe that means it's full of sugar and not really good for me. So when human beings are making, going through this process all the time, kind of honestly, it's very subconscious for us most of the time. We're not assuming that people are good, righteous, right? That we're not assuming, and we don't need to, we in fact shouldn't as economists assume that they have perfect information. No one has perfect information, but people are all the time running around trying to improve their state of affairs. Here's the downside of that. And this is a picture of Adam Smith. Adam Smith is, was a moral philosopher writing during the Scottish Enlightenment. Um, Adam Smith is kind of known today as the father of modern economics. I think, again, the reason is because he had really crucial and important insights about human behavior that allowed him to make important contributions to economic theory. But again, a moral philosopher, not an economist. We didn't even have that kind of discipline back then. So he writes this in really important book called The Wealth of Nations. That's the short title, but it's really an inquiry into the nature and the causes of the wealth of nations. And he publishes that book remarkably in 1776. So imagine a moral philosopher kind of looking at the world in 1776 and saying, some countries are getting richer and some countries are left behind and excluded and remain in poverty. And he doesn't understand that. I feel like we have the same question today. And so he's trying to offer a framework for us to think about that. And so one of his most important contributions is this notion of self-interest, which we see in scripture as well. Okay, so what Adam Smith says is self-interest is just the mechanism of how people engage in choices. It means that I'm going to try anytime I do anything to maximize my benefit that I receive and minimize the cost that I bear or the cost that I have to pay, right? So people are always doing this and this can go really wrong, right? Because it might be in my self-interest to steal from you because I can make myself temporarily better off. You're worse off, but if I'm bigger and stronger, I can use force to kind of make you give me what I want. And this is a society that will never flourish and will be characterized by violence and plunder and theft. And so he is very aware of that. So what he says is, look, to get a prosperous society, we don't have to somehow kind of try to get people to be divorced from their self-interest because that's not possible. But rather we need to use it 
for the common good. So what Adam Smith kind of comes to realize is that self-interest is, again, part of the human condition that we cannot change. It often leads to greed, but he would distinguish between self-interest and greed. And he says, look, actually through a system of private property rights, we can use the self-interest of the entrepreneur. He would call, you know, he would kind of talk about the butcher and the baker and the brewer, right? He talks about how they don't open their shops because of benevolence. They open their stores because of their own self-interest, right? The butcher, the baker and the brewer, why do they open their stores every day? Because they wanna make a profit. But in a system of private property rights, they can't actually get a return on their labor until they give you as the customer what you want, right? So what Adam Smith says is, we don't have to try to change human nature because we can't do that. It will be a full, it's a fool's errand. But what we should do is think about how to funnel that self-interest into the common good. And so kind of he has a remarkable legacy in economics because of that. This is the truth of scripture too. Philippians tells us, the verse says, look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. I think that's an important point, right? God created us with agency, autonomy, and free will to choose things that would benefit us, but also benefit the community, benefit our churches, our families, our neighborhoods. So I think we don't have to think about self-interest as always wrong, you know, and somehow we need to kind of turn the world into altruists. We cannot do that. We have to take human nature as it is, and then kind of think about economic and social institutions as respecting those truths. So I want to spend a little bit of time on some economic realities. Again, this is kind of the stuff where um, these are non-negotiables. They're always true. We don't have to know the mathematical formulas behind them. You don't have to have a PhD in economics. None of that stuff is, is necessary, but we have, to, we have to realize these are true. So I always tell my students, you know, gravity is true, whether I like it or not. And gravity puts constraints on my activities. So I can't walk off the top of a tall building because bad things will happen to me. Why? Because of gravity. So I don't have to agree with gravity. I can dislike gravity, right? But it's a real constraint. And so these economic realities are much the same. They are real constraints. So any type of economic system or political system must respect the, these realities. The most important lesson I think that comes out of economics is that we live in a world of scarcity. Now, we are, you know, if you're dialing in from the United States, you live in one of the richest countries in the world. I mean, we're using Zoom to have a meeting after all, right? This is kind of the product of a lot of innovation and a lot of wealth. Um, and so it's hard to kind of think about scarcity, but I want you to think about the most fundamental element of scarcity as being your time, your time. You only have 24 hours in a day. I always say time is the great equalizer, right? It kind of makes me and the billionaires the same in this regard, right? They have 24 hours and I do, and we don't know how many days we have. And what is God calling us to do with our time? Be fruitful and multiply, right? Work, care for, for the garden and abad, serve each other. So we have a lot of demands and we have a limited amount of resources to be able to do those things. So we have to kind of recognize that scarcity is always with us, right? We have lots of desires and we have limited means to satisfy those desires. And so for the economist, every decision brings a cost. Every single decision that you engage in brings a, a cost. Another way to think about this is there's no free lunch. No free lunch, nothing is free. So there are things that can be zero price. If I take my students out to lunch, I always talk about that, by the way, we've never actually gone out to lunch, so I should probably not use it as an example, but actually take them. But if I did that, right, and I paid for their lunch, their lunch isn't free. They don't have to pay for the pizza, but what are they, how are they paying? They're paying with their precious time, right? So they're coming to sit with me at lunch. That's another hour, hour and a half, two hours of their time that they could be doing other things. So everything comes at some cost. Improving economic conditions means we can lower the costs. We can lower the trade-offs that we face. And that is part of kind of increasing human flourishing. I don't want to overstate it. I don't want to say that human flourishing, biblical human flourishing is all about just GDP growth. It's not. But the reason that economics, uh, economists like income growth is because income gives people choices. It frees up their time. And I'll get to more of that in a moment. The other kind of economic reality, it's always true, is that people respond to incentives. So this is a picture, this is a picture of Walmart, right? Walmart is the world's largest grocer. Walmart is an enormous company and their mission statement is save money, live better. 
So one of the questions I always ask is, why do they care? Why does Walmart care whether I save money on my Honey Nut Cheerios? They don't even know me. I don't know anybody that works. I have Walmart two and a half miles from my house. I don't know anybody that works there, even though I'm there several times a week. So what's going on there, right? Walmart is responding to the incentives that Adam Smith was talking about, which is the way Walmart makes a profit or Amazon or Target or your local grocery store, or even the person that has a, a tent at the local farmer's market. You don't just have to be big entrepreneurs for this to be true. The idea here is that these people that occupy these firms in a market economy are responding to incentives. And in a system of private property rights and prices, their incentive is to help you save money. It's not because they're more benevolent than other people. It's not the explanation, right? The explanation is they're trying to find ways to make money. And in this case, they've been able to make money by helping you save money, which is kind of a very counterintuitive idea, right? So because we live in a world of scarcity, we have to ration. It's a really important concept. We have to figure out there's a fixed amount of stuff and we have to figure out who gets the stuff. So this is where we'll probably talk more next time about those type of decisions, right? But I just want to point out that while I've been talking a lot about the market, so I like to kind of think about the world in Venn diagrams. So if you kind of, this is an over, overly simplified vision of how the world works, of course, but if you kind of think of the three big spheres of human activity, you have the state, right? Federal government, the local government, and the state has force. They have the monopoly of force. They can tell us what to do and they can punish us when we don't do it. Then there's the market. The market doesn't have the power of coercion. The market is about commerce, right? Voluntary exchange. We engage in these commercial relationships with one another. And then civil society. This is where the family sits. This is where churches sit. This is where nonprofits, community theater, all of that stuff. The argument here that I'm going to make briefly is that all of these play a, 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 an important role. So there's this overlapping nature to these spheres. And we live in all of them. Economists mostly focus on, a focus on the market, which is what I'm doing now. But I just want to kind of point out that we can ration scarce resources in all three of these spheres, right? The Red Cross rations scarce resources in a very different way than Whole Foods, right? And the, the government, when they decide to build a bridge or to build a new elementary school, they ration scarce resources in a very different way than the market does. But what's true about the market, the way market economies operate is what I call the three Ps. Prices, property rights, profits and losses. We've already talked a little bit about these. Property rights are the most important element of a market economy because what do they do? They give people incentives to think about how to best invest their resources. Think about a plot of land you might have or cash that you have access to, right? The entrepreneur in a market economy who could be anyone, anybody can be an entrepreneur, at least theoretically, right? And they have ideas about what consumers want and they have this kind of incentive to give it to us in the way that we want it. But you're not gonna get that system without property rights. More importantly, property rights are very important in scripture. Um, in particular, if you look at the Ten Commandments, right? There's kind of um, admonitions against stealing because this idea is that sinners <laughs> need property rights. Why? Because we need constraints. We need guardrails. That's what property rights do. And through property rights, what you get then is the formation of the other two Ps. You get prices. Prices kind of help us figure out exchange. And the real function of prices is to help us understand scarcity, right? When the price of something goes up, that thing has become more scarce, all else equal. When the price of something goes down, we can assume, again, in a market economy, we can assume that that thing has become less scarce. People's lives are improved, right, when things become less scarce. How do things become less scarce? Well, part of it is the profit and loss, right? Firms play a really important role in giving people what they want, learning, discovery, competition with one another, right? So who's Target competing against after all? Walmart, right? They want you to walk through their front doors, not their competitors' front doors. So it's the three Ps that are working together that are kind of the mechanisms of how a market economy works. Remember, civil society doesn't allocate resources in this way. The Red Cross doesn't sell you blood if you need it. They give it to you, right? And they rely on donations to make their operation work successfully. 
the federal government doesn't sell you a bridge. They give you a bridge and then they have to raise money through tax revenue mostly to pay for the bridge, right? So all three spheres can ration scarce resources. What we want to talk about is, you know, which one functions better than the other in different situations. So what that's kind of what we call comparative institutional analysis. So back to kind of the big picture for a minute before we go to Q&A, which will be just momentarily here. Um, you know, I'm an economist, so you know I have to show you a graph, but this is a really exciting one. Um, so there's a lot going on here. I want to try to explain it briefly, but this is just so remarkable to me. So if you look at the orange line, what we're looking at here is GDP, which is gross domestic product. And that's basically kind of, it, it's all goods and services produced in a country in a year, which is kind of a proxy for income. Okay, so that, that's kind of the short story on GDP. We use it as a proxy for income. This is measuring every country in the world that we can get data for since AD1. You heard that right, AD1. So it's a long time. There's a lot in this graph, right? This is adjusted for inflation. It's adjusted for purchasing power. It's as granular as you can get this kind of macroeconomic data. And look at what we see. And I want you to think about Pennington's description of human flourishing. This orange line hovers on the horizontal axis for most of human history. It's not, by the way, until 1900 that world GDP crosses $1,000 per person per year threshold. It takes a long time, almost 2,000 years for us to cross that threshold. Most people, for most of human history, live, we believe, on between $1 and, one and $3 a day. And they've died very young, died in childbirth, Ch children die very young. So you, it, it's, it, people have a hard time with the being fruitful and multiply, right? And so then what happens? This is called the hockey stick graph. So you and I are born in the handle of the hockey stick where you see this exponential upshoot of this orange graph, right? So what happens? And I think a lot of discussion needs to kind of happen around this question. Um, there's, a, a, of course, many explanations and there's tons in the economics literature about what's going on and why it took so long and all this kind of thing. Because I think about this as a Christian and I think about the garden and in the garden, we were given everything we needed, just abundant natural resources, abundant. And we were given the greatest gift of all was our human capacity and human creativity, right? But it takes a really long time for us to kind of generate wealth. Um, and so lots of things, of course, slow this down. And we can talk about that if people have questions. But I want to show you this graph, too, because I think it's, again, going back to that Genesis verse, be fruitful and multiply. If you look at this graph, which is over the same time period for human population, world population, right? Look at this. Those slopes of those graphs, look at this. I'm going to go backwards, sorry. They are almost identical. Look at the orange line, and then you see the blue line here, okay? So how is this possible? Because in AD 400, you know, there wasn't a lot of population density. Um, we weren't straining natural resources in perhaps the way we are now but people just can't survive, right? So you have no income growth and you have no population growth. And then look at what happens. As countries start to get you know, a little bit richer, population grows. And so there's some people, especially in American politics, I would say, that are really worried about population growth and they wanna stop it. But if you understand economics and more importantly, you ground that economics in Christianity, you understand that people are good for the planet. People are the ultimate resource. There's a great book called The Ultimate Resource by economist Julian Simon. And he says, look, all this stuff about these apocalyptic, you know, we're going to overpopulate the earth and we're going to run out of resources are not true if people have the one thing they need, which is economic freedom. That's what they need. Because here's the thing, we are interdependent beings and we have to find ways to cooperate. God designed us that way. We can't thrive alone. We can't even survive alone. So these two graphs show like really exciting things that are happening, right? Population is growing, obviously can't grow exponentially forever. Wealth is growing and wealth is growing faster than population is growing. And so I think that there's really, if you look at it this way, I think there's lots of reasons to be optimistic about the future. As After all, as Christians, we have hope. Our hope comes in Christ, not in GDP growth, of course, right? But I think we can see the truths of scripture and the truths of how we cultivate and carve out human flourishing, um, any economic system that tries to do that is going to have to work, you know, kind of respect these objective truths and realities. So, Mason, I think I'm going to stop there.
What do you think? And see if we have time for questions or, I mean, I know we have time, but I'll let you just kind of take it from here and tell me what we're doing next. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, we have um, a lot of questions. Um, one early one here. Um, could you repeat the full name of the theologian who wrote, writes on human flourishing? Absolutely. His name is Jonathan Pennington, P-E-N-N-I-N-G-T-O-N. Okay. He just wrote a book on the Sermon on the Mount. He has written a chapter in our book um, on human flourishing. And actually he has a, I think a PDF uh, on the Institute for Faith, Work and Economics website. There's a PDF of his research article. And I, I'm pretty sure the title is a biblical explanation of human flourishing or something like this, where you'll find that direct quote, but he's, he's wonderful. I think he takes it all the way to the beginning, kind of incorporating philosophical explanations, um, biblical explanations. So that's his name. Okay, great. Um, well, we'll, um, we, I don't think we'll get to every one of these questions, but, um, we'll try. Um, here's one. Um, how should Christians today manage their assets to grow wealth in light of one biblical teachings against charging interest, i.e. usury, mm -hmm. and two, Jesus's parable that praises the servants that grew their master's wealth. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that this is important, right, which is to think about what an appropriate rate of interest would be. Um, I think it's very important for people who are thinking about growing their wealth. I mean, you're, you're going to be involved in the global banking sector. And so um, it, it's important to think about, especially I think when we're considering people who are marginalized and we think about how to bring them into market economies um, through loans or wealth, you know, kind of other wealth creation strategies, we don't want to take advantage of them. So I think the biblical lesson there is, we are not to unduly take advantage of people by charging kind of what we might call an excessive rate of interest, but rather trying to articulate in a, in a given setting what is an appropriate rate of interest um, and thinking about how the market economy can fill some of that need. But I would also say, I think this is where churches and charities can play a role too, which is um, trying to help people build wealth. Um, again, especially people who have been kind of excluded or marginalized. Um, and, you know, I think that the second part of the question is important, which is to say, um, you know, I mean, there's kind of no, the idea of wealth and poverty are very well covered topics in scripture. Um, so there's a lot of warnings about wealth. There's a lot of warnings about coveting money and coveting wealth. I think Jesus exactly knew how we were going to be about this, um, that we're going to covet what other people have, you know, all this kind of things. And so I think, you know, you're the question about identifying that, you know, um, the parable of the talents actually is a, a parable about stewardship, right? The master says, each of you, according to your abilities, is what it says, according to your abilities, is given a different amount, and you are to steward it for me. And the person who puts it in the ground, because they're so, it's just like a hoarding mentality, right? The person who does that is, is admonished and, 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 you know, sent out of the master's presence. It says there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. So there's a consequence, right? For, for not using our gifts, it's a metaphor for your gifts, to serve other people. And again, in the market economy, this is only one way that we serve people, by the way. We do this in through our church and in our neighborhoods. So I'm an economist focusing on how the, what role the market economy has in wealth creation and flourishing but it can't solve all of our problems. But I do think that sometimes in Christian circles, we kind of think the only way we serve our fellow human beings is through charity and churches rather than through the marketplace sector. And I think that parable is really a great example of God has given you finite gifts and he's asking you to use those gifts and grow them and in the process serve other people. So I think it's a great lesson for, you know, your two kind of points here are the tensions between those two things. Um, and so I think we have to keep both of those in mind. Um, as a segue uh, into what you just said, um, during your talk, you, you mentioned um, these two terms, self-interest and greed in relation to some of your discussion about Adam Smith and some of our videos and Praxis Circle, other economists weigh into this. Um, 
what is the distinction between self-interest and greed or, or when, when do those lines start to blur and, and how is the market, how does, how does a free market respond? Is a free market powered more by self-interest or is it powered more by greed? How, how, do, how do you see those two forces in, in a free economy? It's a great question, Mason. And I think this is tough for people because, you know, there are some economists um, at my home institution um, of George Mason and others who kind of walk around saying things like greed is good, you know, greed is good. And you remember um, what the original Wall Street movie where Gordon Gecko has this kind of soul yes. where greed makes things run, you know, kind of this stuff. And so I think as Christians, we have to say, no, no, greed is never good because greed is about unmitigated desire. Right. Greed is about I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to cheat on the test to get the A. I'm going to, you know, what there's many manifestations of what greed is. Self-interest is the mechanism of choice. Self-interest is I'm hungry in the morning. I actually need to eat to fuel my body. That's a self-interested thing to do. Now I can have a whole birthday cake for breakfast. Is that greed? I don't know. Right. But it's probably not a good idea. At, at, at minimum, right? Uh, it's gluttonous for sure. And so I think it's this is where it gets tough, Mason, to try to answer your question, because I don't think there's just um, kind of one way to say, well, eating this for breakfast is good and eating this for breakfast is bad. Um, I think this, that there's a lot of nuance in these conversations, but I get worried when we either, either try to kind of um, make greed sound like it's not a problem and, and just market economies are going to run on greed. I think market economies run on, again, market economies, not non-market economies, but market economies run on self-interest, always with the capacity for greed, bounded by private property rights. So what private property rights do in a market economy is they govern us. They regulate, mm -hmm. they discipline. So there's no system in which you're not going to have greed because we're all capable of it and we all do it right at any given day. All of us are greedy in some way. Um, but the question, I think, is how do you contain the greed? Right. So that's not the kind of. Basis of market operations. And so I think, you know, there's a really fan, I wish we could show it a fantastic. I encourage people to look this up on YouTube. It is a great. Um, episode of Phil Donahue. So this is like back in the 80s, daytime talk show. Phil Donahue is interviewing Milton Friedman. It is phenomenal. And Milton Friedman is very witty, of course. And, you know, mm -hmm. Milton Friedman, he asked people about greed. He's like, is it really a good idea? Should we really run on greed? And then Milton Friedman just turns it right back and says, do you think <laughs> there's anything that doesn't run on greed? Like, do you think the American president does not operate on greed? Do you think, you know, do you, so he's just basically saying greed is everywhere we need to kind of constrain the greed, right? We need to mitigate it because greed is actually not good. And so I think that's a really important distinction, especially for Christians, um, because you know I don't think we need to run around saying people shouldn't be self-interested because people are self-interested and actually that's how we're designed. And self-interest can include sacrifice. So you know anybody here that has children, you've probably done a lot for your children that you didn't want to do, but it was it was for their good and thus your responsibility and for your good. So self-interest can involve sacrifice, greed never does. So I think that's kind of keeping those distinctions really present in our mind is important because I don't think it's right to say market economies run on greed. I think it's just market economies are populated by human beings, all of which can be greedy at any moment. So what are the governance mechanisms that kind of quell that greed? Um, here's one question from, um, one of our participants uh, who lives in South Africa or I, or is South African. Um, I'm a South African and we have huge inequalities. Mm -hmm. On a high level, what would you think would work to bridge this huge divide? What business models was, would work? Yeah, this is a great, a very practical question. I'm not an expert um, on the South African economy. So I'm sorry that I can't speak directly to that. Um, but I can kind of try to generally answer the question. And so I have tried to tackle this issue of inequality because I think that there's some important things. I think there's kind of bad inequality and good inequality. And I'll try to explain what I mean by that. I think bad inequality is ill gotten income growth. And by, by when I say ill gotten, 
what I usually mean by that is not just, it could be just outright theft, of course, but really what we mean in the setting of a market is, you know, privilege, right? So some corporations, some industries, they get subsidies, they get special regulations, maybe they can agitate for a free trade agreement to be not as much free trade because it benefits people at home. All of these types of different things, we kind of are now calling this cronyism. Economists have traditionally referred to it as rent seeking, right? So businesses that are seeking rents or privilege or benefits. And so that I think is a real big problem in, in every country, but by a matter of degree. I think it's a problem in the United States as well, which is that there's this corporate privilege and that corporate privilege allows you to pad your bottom line and it creates this kind of un, unequal playing field. And what it really does is it stifles innovation, right? And so when I think about like for the American economy, I think about the pharmaceutical industry. This is an industry that benefits from very restrictive regulations. And so the people who are participants in this industry now, it's kind of like a boutique industry, right? You don't have like startup mom and pop pharmaceutical companies. And that's actually the problem, right? Because you have to pay to play. It's a billion dollar game. And so this just kind of, truncates economic mobility in that industry. And it hurts consumers, right? Because we don't have as much innovation and dynamism as we otherwise would. So I think in different countries, a way to kind of track what's going on with that bad income inequality is to use the economic freedom of the world report because they actually try to track one of the things they measure. And I'll talk about this more next time is regulations in the economy. So what businesses get these kind of preferential regulations that allows them to grow their wealth at the expense of other people, right? So that's kind of a winner loser type of story. So that kind of inequality, I think we need to stop. It's very hard to stop, right? Because the people that you need to stop it, who are the politicians who write laws <laughs> are the very people who benefit from it. So it's really a tough challenge. Right. That's really hard. So the good type of inequality is this. Somebody comes up with an innovation or an idea that hasn't, you know, it, it could be a new innovation on an existing product or a product that hasn't existed before. And the market rewards them very handsomely with lots of income. That's great, right? Because that is an example of a company that is solving our problems, right? So think about the invention sure. of the pacemaker or the invention, you know, kind of cancer fighting drugs. We want to reward innovation in those sectors because it's going to reap benefits on the whole society. And so I think that type of inequality is not zero sum. So I think that type of inequality should be celebrated. Entrepreneurs who have, you know, kind of really tapped into a way to improve our lives, they're rich because we as consumers have made them rich, right? We shop with their products and we actually make them rich, but they make us richer. So the societal wealth growth is huge from that. So that's kind of the principled way I would answer your question. Then I think we can take a look at the index to go into the details of what's going on, you know, kind of country to country to see kind of what are the problems um, and where's the cronyism, you know, worse or better. Sure. Um, here's another one. Uh, early in the presentation, you mentioned the importance of increasing income. Does increasing income always equate to increasing purchasing power? Isn't it really about purchasing power rather than income? Yeah. So what we always want to do is adjust all of our income data for these types of things. But you're right to say, if your income is growing, but your purchasing power is declining, then you're not winning. <laughs> I mean, you're not gaining anything as a consumer, mm -hmm. right? So when we think about, I mean, obviously, everybody's talking about inflation right now. Um, it's, a, it's a topic that's um, on everybody's hearts and minds, I think. And, and this is, you know, so if you're a teacher and you got a 3% salary increase last year, but inflation is 8.2%, then you're behind. Um, and so GDP is honestly a very blunt instrument for measuring income. I wouldn't necessarily throw it out, but I like to use GDP in addition to other empirical measures that help us understand the kind of overall flourishing levels of a society, right? So. Um, that, again, I mentioned economic freedom in the last answer, and we're going to talk more about that next time, but I think that helps us. But you're right. It, it's mm -hmm. not just about nominal income growth. It's about real income. Real income growth means income adjusted for inflation. Um, we want to look at purchasing power across countries if we're doing global income comparison. So you're absolutely right. And maybe next time I have a really cool graph to show um, in the United States economy. 
you can look at the baseline level of, of inflation. And there's some, there's some products that have like radically elevated in their prices, which makes us worse off. And there's some products that have hmm. radically declined in their prices and huh. that makes us better off. And so one interesting question is why? Like, why is healthcare getting more expensive and TVs are getting cheaper? You know, maybe we want both to get cheaper, but that's what makes people better off. So it's a perfect question because it's not just raw GDP. It's income relative to purchasing power and, you know, what the ordinary person can purchase. And so we pay a lot of attention to that as economists. Um, just a few more questions here. Um, in our playlist, uh, several Praxis contributors in, in many of our videos um, talk about the importance of the family. Mm -hmm. And we have, a, we have a question here that um, says, it seems that certain cultures, and we certainly see this played out recently in, in political campaigns, uh, certainly here in Virginia, it seems that some cultures, um, for example, maybe the US and, and European nations are um, dismantling the family unit or interpreting the family unit in different ways uh, than maybe a biblical version or a traditional way. Yeah. Um, so there's sort of two different questions here. How do you see the family unit fitting in uh, in a capitalist economic system or a free market system? What is the role of the family? And what are the economic and societal consequences if the definition of a biblical family starts to change? Yeah, that's such a great question. And of course, so relevant right now. Um, I don't think just in the US, but certainly in the US. Um, so the family is the most fundamental element of society. It's the most fundamental institution, I should say. Um, it's where we're born. It's where we're raised. It's where um, we understand lots of things like authority, love, grace. You know, all of those things are, come from the family. And so I think we need to be very careful about safeguarding the sanctity of that institution. But I say that, and I'm also very careful to say, as an economist, you know, kind of be very careful what you agitate, right? So how do, I mean, maybe this is part of your question, I don't know, but, you, you know, what is the role of the state in protecting the family? This is like a much harder question to answer, I think, because mm -hmm. you don't want to invite the state into the family. Um, this was actually part of the Marxist program, part of Mao's program, is to annihilate the family because the family is an institution that gets in the way of what the state wants to do, right? If the family is where you learn love, if the family is where you learn relationships, if the family is where you get your most primary level of education, right? Not just the school, and that comes much later. You're learning all sorts of things in your family from infancy till the day you die, right? So if that is a really important institution that safeguards people from the state in some ways, because it's where I get my values. It's where I learn. It's where I'm safe. It's where I love. And so it's very clear why kind of in Marxist um, projects, the family had to be destroyed, right? So I'm not saying all this is Marxism, mm -hmm. but I am saying that that's very clear um, because the, the family kind of is a, 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 an impediment to what that larger social project is trying to accomplish. So family needs to be protected. How do we do this? I really think the most fundamental way we do this is through culture, because here's the thing, I'm just a very firm believer in this culture. You know, politics is always downstream from culture in a democracy. Politics sure. is downstream from culture. So culture is gonna shift politics. And so if you wanna protect the family, what are we going to do at the grassroots cultural level to do that? And I think even just, you know, I could talk about this all day. I know you have more questions, so I won't. But I mean, look at COVID. COVID changed a lot about the family and just the way we were relating to one another. But I think COVID got parents more involved in their education. It forced them to. I'm not saying this sure. is the ideal way to do that, right? But it actually kind of, people are opting out of public schools in many ways because they kind of said, this is not the way, you know? And so- I think that there are some kind of um, paradigm shifts that happen through events like this that can cause us to shift, kind of rethink our values and rethink, you know, what we need to fight for. Um, I, you know, I don't know all the answers to your question, but I think this is a real issue that we need to pay attention to. And I think the church needs to take the lead on talking about this. 
just talking about it. What are we going to do? How are we going to protect the family? I'm more worried about government inviting government in to protect the family because I think that open that makes the family vulnerable to the government when you know the people you've invited in are not in power anymore. Right, so that you don't want to create these kind of vacuums for power, and I, so I do worry about that as well. Okay, final question: um, How does Christianity think about wealth distribution? That's a good question as well. I think that kind of goes to um, the question about inequality to some extent, but also the question about poverty, which, by the way, I would say those are entirely separate questions. I think. In the conversations about inequality, we tend to say, well, inequality is one side of the coin and poverty is one side of the other, which is absolutely not true because you could have a society where there's lots of income inequality and no poverty because everybody's like got a very high standard of living, but some people are far richer. So hmm. this question right. of distribution, I, I also worry when people ask that question, what they mean. Uh, I'm, and I'm just saying that so we're all on the same page as uh, try to answer it. There's no one in a market society that distributes income. Right. That's not how it works. Nobody is hands out paychecks and says, this is your allotment and this is your allotment and this is your allotment. In a market economy, income is earned. It's not distributed. And so but in the earning, right, we get more for less. And we we see very empirically tight relationships with kind of more free societies have lots more income growth. So there's lots more economic mobility in a country that has a free market society and something like a democracy, right? Or a constitutional republic, a, you know, political liberalism is what I mean here. So I think that those things very tightly right. together. Um, so I don't know, you know, I think that in a more centrally planned society, income is more distributed, right? If you, or if you have a country like Sweden, which is actually a very free society, they're not socialists. We can talk about that next time if you want, but they redistribute a lot more income. So there are, is this question, does that fit in the Christian model? And I would say my short answer to it is if people vote for that and they're okay with that, I guess it's okay, right? But Sweden has a population that is what, like 5 million, 8 million, I don't know what their population is. It's very small and we have 350 million people. So just because that works right. in one setting, I don't think that means it translates to, to our setting. So it all depends on what the political will is. But to live in that type of society, you have to be okay with this. I get to take some of somebody else's income to do things that I want to do. How does that fit into the Christian model? I have questions about that because it implies that I have a right to some of your income to do things that I think are good. You know, I think the state is should give people free college, for example, right? That's that requires a lot of redistribution of wealth. So do we have a right to other people's income so we can get a college degree? I'm not sure about that. I actually I think the answer is no. So that's, you know, I think um, thinking about what types of economic systems afford greater wealth creation is a better question than how do we distribute income more fairly, which I'm not saying you were asking. I just think that gets caught up in this conversation. Sure, sure, sure. Well, Anne, thank you. I mean, this has been, I've learned so much during this and um, to all of the, the folks out there who have attended, uh, thank you for being here. I'm sorry we didn't get to every one of the questions, um, but we'll we'll try to get to some some form of those questions maybe in the next webinar uh, in two weeks. Um, but Anne, thank you so much for your insight, your expertise, your faith, your sharing your time and your talents with us. Um, and thank all of you for, for being with us today. Um, this, this has just been a wonderful experience for me to learn and think about building my own worldview and questioning things that I thought were, um, I thought were true. And, and I think that's the purpose of learning. Um, for everyone who made it to class today, you'll receive a digital copy of Anne's book, Be Fruitful and Multiply, as I mentioned in my opening remarks. Uh, we look forward to seeing all of you in two weeks, November 16th, at the same time, noon Eastern time, uh, for our second part of our webinar series on applying economics to human flourishing. And in the meantime, we at Praxis Circle extend our very best to you. Please visit our website at www.praxiscircle.com, where you can find resources, blog posts, and interviews dedicated to building your worldview. Thank you, Anne, so much. Thank you to all of you and have a great couple of weeks. Thank you. Have a great day.